Right. Um, and so now kind of pivoting over to the more fiscal side of things, how do you think about, you know, the risk of the persistently high government deficits that we've seen recently, you know, especially considering that neither of the two presidential candidates on the ballot are likely to, you know, curtail spending upon taking office? Yeah, I, I think uh, you could think about uh, that in sort of two different uh, uh, elements of it, which is one, if you think about it from a macroeconomic perspective or a growth perspective, um, persistent elevated deficits are not necessarily that beneficial to growth. Now, this is a uh, probably a, a perspective that you're not going to hear uh, that's incongruous with the consensus where people talk about the direct deficit being the primary driver of U.S. growth. I don't believe that that's true and have written extensively about why that is. But to help build the sort of core intuition, uh, if you think about deficit simply as, uh, as let's just say, you, you, you oversimplify what the government does. You just say what the government does is it takes in taxes and it engages in transfer payments. Well, if transfer payments in period one are $100, and transfer payment, you say they take in no taxes and they borrow and do a transfer payment of $100. If in period one, uh, they do a $100 transfer payment, uh, what that does is it supports someone's income by $100 and they're spending by $100. If, and, they're def and the government's deficit is $100. If in period two, the government does the same exact thing, $100 of transfer payments, $0 of taxes, transfers it over, Someone's income in period two is $100 supplemented. Their spending is $100 supplemented. The GDP growth impact of that is zero. GDP growth impact is zero if deficits are constant. And so instead, in order to get economic expansion growth from deficits, deficits actually have to rise in size in order to increase growth. And that's not what we're seeing right now. We're seeing large deficits. But actually, the deficit today is down from where it was a few years ago, immediately after COVID. And so what that highlights is, from an economic perspective, deficits are not driving the expansion of economic conditions. Deficits are supporting the level of spending, but they're not driving the growth rate in spending. As a simple example, in the last three years, U.S. GDP on an annualized basis is up $7 trillion, and deficits have contracted by about a trillion dollar annualized rate. What's filling that gap is income. Income is driving growth. That's what's going on with the deficits from a macroeconomic standpoint. It's not the deficits driving growth. In the last couple of years, it's income driving growth. From a bond supply demand perspective, from a markets perspective, the level of deficits is actually quite relevant to what's going on with the bond price. When you think about what's going on with the bond price, any market is just supply and demand going on. In the US government bond market, there's one supplier. It is the government <laughs> issuing the bonds, right? That's essentially sales, bond sales. And then the question is, who's demanding the bonds? The persistent large level of deficit means that we have a big supply of duration coming into the market, which has to be bought every day. Every day there's a bond auction, and those bond auctions are larger than they've basically ever been, except during the very height of COVID. And so I think that's very interesting because essentially what it's doing, it's creating a persistent downward pressure on bond prices, upward pressure on yields, because they have to find an incremental buyer, an incremental buyer, an incremental buyer to buy all of that duration supply. And you know, right here in the second quarter, we have about twice as much net duration supply uh, as existed in previous quarters because those deficits are so large. And so what it's creating is it's creating the level of the deficit is creating a weight on bond prices or an upward pressure on yields. And then that upward pressure on yields is then flowing through to what the discount rate is on all assets. And that discount rate on, on all assets is flowing through to asset prices. And those asset prices are what ultimately influence whether or not people you know, continue to spend at the same spend and save at the same pace that they have been, or start to pull back and start to create that economic slowing. 